protect the Lord, take, take care of her, be over her, take care of her every time she's at home, be looking after her, look over her, Lord. Let her have anything and everything she needs, Lord, to be with that woman because she's a good lady. Lord, be with my dad and my mom, protect my dad, and protect everybody too, Lord. Be with my dad, that he's so good, I was thinking doing things. My mom too, be with her, don't let her get sick anymore, Lord. Be with her back to your health. I pray, Lord, in Jesus Christ. misplaced it, couldn't find it for just a second. We're glad you're with us. We're in the process of studying the book of Exodus. <clears throat> Last week we uh, introduced chapter number two as a, as a means of refreshing chapter number one. <clears throat> we found the Israelite people called Hebrews in the nation of Egypt. <clears throat> A new Pharaoh came into power, and Pharaoh is a title, it's not the name of a person. But a new Pharaoh came into power that did not know Joseph. If you recall your Bible history, Joseph was the one that was second in command of all of Egypt. During that time, he brought his family down and they uh, resided in Egypt, but they became very populated. And so this new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, nor did he show favoritism to the Hebrew people, enslaved them. He was concerned about their great numbers and afraid they would show alliance to the enemies. And so he made them slaves. And they stayed slaves for quite a few years. And he sent out a decree that all the little male babies would be put to death. During that time and under that decree, Moses was born to Jehochebed and Jehochebed, his mother, you recall the story, hid him in a basket in the Nile River. <coughs> Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh because Pharaoh's daughter found him floating in the basket. She took him to be her own and through God's providence, Moses' mother became the nurse and took care of the baby as he grew up and taught him about God and his people and godly values. Acts chapter 7 gives us a commentary on this time of history. Stephen is preaching to the Jewish audience and he's reviewing the Old Testament history and in that chapter, he tells us when Moses was 40 years of age, he saw one of the Hebrews being mistreated by the Egyptian. He killed the Egyptian. Thinking he was doing a favor for his Hebrew people, thinking this might be a way he could provide deliverance for them from this bondage, thinking that no one saw him. Well, the next day, he went back down amongst the people and he saw two Hebrew people arguing with one another. And he said something to them about how they don't need... They were to be extradited back into Egypt, so he couldn't go there. But then he went to meet again. A sizable journey. And so we're going to look at verse number 15 of Exodus chapter 2. And when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. That is, heard about him killing the Egyptian. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. 
when Moses got there, he said down by a well, that was the watering system where people came to water their livestock and got water and such. I suppose he knew it would probably be a place of social gathering. He would meet some people. But there he said, and, and uh, when he, he probably felt that his plan had failed in delivering the Hebrews. Perhaps he felt that God was not with him. I mean, here is a man that lived in nobility for 40 years of his life. He was in the house of Pharaoh, having the best of the best having the best of education, the best food, the best clothing. And now he finds himself a fugitive on the run. Could it be he felt God has abandoned me? Felt defeated? I don't know if he did or not, but I can see how he could. Because, you know, in life circumstances, oftentimes we find ourselves in that situation, don't we? Where things seem to get turned upside down. Everything seems to go wrong. This is where Moses was. But Moses was right where God wanted him. When Moses was in Egypt, when he was living in the house of Pharaoh, he was too big to carry out God's will. But out here in this desert, God changes him. Forty years he spends out here in this area of that meeting. <laughs> and preparing himself for what God wanted him to do. Notice, if you will, verse number 16, then we get your thoughts. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The priest of Midian. Who were these Midianites? Let me talk to memory just a little bit. Moses was a descendant of Abraham. Down through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and down through that lineage. But when Sarah, the wife of Abraham, died, Abraham remarried. Genesis chapter number 25. He married a woman named Keturah. And Keturah had several boys, one of which was Midian. These people were descendants of Abraham, just as was Joseph. But they came down to the lineage of Keturah rather than Sarah. But they were distant cousins. Growing up under the influence of Abraham, most likely they too believed in God. Most likely they, they were worshiping God in a right way. This father of these girls, he was a priest. And he was carrying on the worship activities. He would accept the gifts of the people and provide them in worship as, as priests would do. And so there's a link there biologically between these two families. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up to help them and watered their flock. While Moses was there and these girls showed up, verse number 8 of 17, some other shepherds came, run the women away. Moses came to their defense. He run these shepherds away so the women could, these women could have water. But I want you to notice that Moses stood up and helped them. Moses became a servant. Here's a point of interest, I think, to me. Up until this time, Moses probably had everything given to him. 
People served him because of his position. They would bring food to him. They would take care of him. They would, they would cater down to him. I mean, he was in royalty. His friend, Eddie Pablo, was the most powerful man in the world at that time. So Moses was used to being catered to. Now, what does he find? The role has reversed. He becomes a servant. He helped water these sheep. And I can't help but think, probably this is one of the very few, if not the first time, that Moses had an opportunity to be a servant. Things were changing. He is no longer under the influence of Egypt. He is probably still dressed in his Egyptian garb, his clothing. For the next few verses, these women go home and tell their father, he's an Egyptian. Most likely the way they knew that was because of his dress. Maybe the way he talked. But I can, in my mind's eye, I can imagine him still being dressed in all the royalty clothing and they knew he was from Egypt. He was somebody of position. And here he is watering the sheep. Don't you think that would make an impression? Oh, look at Your thoughts? There's a reference in my verse in my verse that uh, reference uh, Genesis 29 and verse 10 and that goes pretty close to what Jacob did when he when he rolled the stone away and uh, allowed Rachel so <coughs> God is like you say he's entwined in this in this life yeah. in this relationship with Moses kind yeah. of guiding him where he needs to be good others Well, I never thought of that. The reason is, I never thought of it being uh, him dressed as a uh, priest. Well, it doesn't say so. I mean, he was more than likely. He left in a hurry. So, I mean, they they knew. I mean, they knew he's an Egyptian. They knew he's an Egyptian. How are they going to know that? Either by either by the way he talked, the way he was dressed. And I'm thinking he's probably dressed maybe both. And then, and to know that that. A connection to Abraham, too. I mean, I never knew that. There's, there's a link there. Yeah, the link. There's a link there. Verse number 18. After the incidents at the well, the women go back to their father and tell him what had taken place. So it says that when they came to rule their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hands of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. Rule. King James Version, some use the word regul. He also has another name, chapter 3, called Jethro. So there's two or three words here that can be used to describe this priest of the Midian, the father of these daughters. But they gave a report of what had happened. Moses was able to save these daughters. He was surprised that they got back so quickly. Apparently on a normal day, it would take them longer than that. Maybe they were accustomed to being run off and having to come back and take a while. Maybe the assistant to Moses sped things up quite a bit, but regardless, he was pretty amazed that they got back so soon. And then he says to the daughters from Twenty, Where is he? This man that rescued, where is he? I would like to meet him, so to speak. Why is it that thou hast left the man? Call him that we may eat bread. Go get him. Bring him in. I'd like to feed him and him get to know him. So 
So they do. And Moses was content to dwell with the men. Apparently a lot of things <coughs> happened between verse 20 and verse 21. Quite a bit of time elapsed. They went and got him, and then it says, and, and he gave Moses, Zephora, his daughter. That idea of giving his daughter, they were married. So time, it seems to me, elapsed. They got to know the family, got to know the women, got to know this one particular woman. Jethro gave his approval for them to marry, and they, they became married. And they had a child. And this child's name is Gershom. So the end of verse 22, and she bare him a son and called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Sephora means a small bird. That's what the word means. A small bird. We've got bird feeders in our backyard, and this time of year especially, I've been noticing a lot of birds coming in. They're little bitty birds. Every once in a while a blue jail come in and run away. The little bitty birds. But they're so entertaining to me. They're pretty colorful. Zephora. Small bird. <laughs> then you have Gershom. The name Gershom means a stranger. Or the idea of someone who doesn't stay, or someone that's staying in a far country. So, the end of verse number 22, they call his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. That's what Moses described himself. Because Moses felt like a stranger in a strange land, he named his son Stranger. Gershom. So you got Moses now living in this land of Midian, way down here, in this area of the wilderness, taking care, he began to take care of Jethro's or his father-in-law's sheep. He's married. Has a small family. And I think we make a mistake sometimes thinking of Paul. Moses was in this area of Midian. He was just waiting for God to use him. In my time, there was more to it than that. <coughs> While he was in this land of media, he learned some things that he never learned in Egypt. Now, he learned much in Egypt. But I want to suggest to you, he learned a lot more in media. For one thing, he learned to work. He had never had a job in his life. He was a shepherd. He learned to appreciate nature. He learned to uh, uh, do, take on some responsibilities. And it's interesting to me. We're going to get into this episode here of the burning bush here pretty quick. And again, you go back to Acts chapter 7. And you will learn that Moses spent 40 years in Midian. I mentioned to you before, let me go back and repeat it. Moses lived to be 120 years old. You can divide his life into three 40 year segments. He lived 40 years in Egypt. He lived 40 years down here in the Mount Sinai area called Hebron. <laughs> then he lived 40 years in leading the Israelites from Egypt all the way back up here toward the Promised Land. Three 40-year segments. But for 40 years he was taking care of sheep. And the thing that's amazing to me is he never had a flock of his own. You would think after 40 years he would accumulate a few things for himself. You would think he would have been like Jacob was when he went over into the uh, and got Rachel that he, he, he collected his own herd. Not so. So it seemed to Moses. All those 40 years he was just a hired hand. A son-in-law. 
taking care of Jethro's or Ruel's sheep. Never had a flock of his own. But he learned some values while he was there. It was not just a waiting time. It was a training period for Moses. And then we get God speaking to him. Before we go to verses 23 to 25, your thoughts. I have no idea what time it is. The clock says 10 minutes past 8. <laughs> so you, you just... I've done how long with beer? 10.24. 10.24. Alright. I asked Chris to flag me here when about 20 minutes till time, so we, we got it covered. Yes, ma'am? You know, we grow out of that adversity. And this is a foreshadowing, at least for me, that we have to have a huge job when you think about how the how the <coughs> children of Israel, first Pharaoh and then the children of Israel, tested his patience, his faith, his everything that he had. Even his brother is in on the golden cat, you yeah. know, down there. And unless we learn and are in a an uncomfortable thing, all growth causes pain of some kind. And especially to come from royalty, where I don't know any royal people, but I heard that they are pretty dismissive to the common people, you know, they're, they're servant people to them. And he must have had a mindset like that when he lived in the palace. You would think? Yes, he would assume. And then to go and, and shepherd these flocks, which is basically what he was going to do with humans as shepherds. Uh, being a teacher, it's amazing how much I learned to work with kids by milking cows for years. It, it kind of amazes the relationships and, and you have to build some relationships and learn some skills to lead a, a flock or a herd or a group of people. And he had the Lord's help all the way, but he also had to learn those rudimentary skills yes. of leadership. And he learned all that in this day. Yes, yes. And so it, I just point. see this as a foreshadowing of, of things to come. Also during this 40 year time, I've alluded to it, but I want to go back and mention it for emphasis. He's probably learning about God. Because this family had the same biblical roots that his family had. So he's probably learning a little about worship, a little bit about how God is, a little bit about prayer, a little bit, you know, he's, he's in an environment to train him spiritually. He didn't have that in Egypt outside of his mother. But now he, he's in that environment and, and he is preparing himself. Heath, do you have something? Yeah. I'm looking at the map in my Bible and it, you, you said Midian is showing it over there across the Gulf. The Gulf. But yeah, it's sort of, it's sort of, of the it. region of meeting at this time sort of covered. Yeah, yeah. Like, and there's some on the other side of that gulf too that's kind yeah. of meeting. Yeah. What, what I'm looking at is the the route, the Exodus route. And it's kind of, and, and, and he's there now, but he was up there in Egypt. It's kind of a scouting. Did it? What you're going to find. He ends up a little bit later. That gulf. What you're going to find when he leads the children of Egypt out of. Uh, 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 children of Israel in Egypt, they come and they spend a long time right here. Mount Sinai, that's where he got the Ten Commandments. I mean, when he leads these people down to get to the Promised Land, they leave Egypt, they don't go straight up here. They come down this way and they hang around here for quite a while. See, you don't just break camp with six million people and just move on the the morning. It takes a, an effort. In fact, there are some rules given over in the, in the in Deuteronomy how to break the tent and how to make the movement. So when they settled here, they stayed here quite a few months. But this is old homeland for Moses. We might say he knew every pig trail. Because this is where he spent 40 years. When they ended up way up the top. Way up here is the promised land. That's where they... And that's called desert or desert block. This is, this is where they go into the land of Canaan. Right, they, they cross the river right, right above the Dead Sea. 
come in and, and conquer that area. But they wandered in this wilderness for 40 years. This is where, but it all, they spent a lot of time in this area where Moses is staying now. So, and, and we see it, we see it as desert, like you're saying, but they, they live around these watering systems. I, I was just listening just a modern part podcast this morning talking about duck yeah. and stuff. And those people that have river systems and lakes and ponds and stuff and that moist soil they can plant they, they can. The, the stuff they need to get. Chris Warren and that's where people has spent a lot of time over there in the military in that area. And we was talking about this the other day and he was commenting now they have some irrigation systems. Well there's irrigation that's very, very plush grows very fertile land. You got, you got that sediment that moves around and stuff yeah. and it's it's good soil and it's good farming and that's where people congregate around rivers and water systems. Alright. And it came to pass in the process of time, number 23, that process of time was 40 years. <coughs> that process of time that the king of Egypt died, the Pharaoh the Pharaoh that wanted to take Moses' life. Now, when he dies, things change. Moses now has the liberty to go back into Egypt. Prior to, he was a wanted man, but apparently when he dies, all that changed. And the children of Israel said, by reason of bondage, they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of bondage. They called on God. I imagine when a new Pharaoh come onto the scene, those slaves probably thought maybe things are going to get better. Maybe things are going to change. Not so. Things didn't get any better, so they continued to cry. And verse number 24 tells us God heard their cry. And God remembered their bondage. And God remembered the promise that He had given to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And He remembered how He told Abraham, now people are going to be taken away into bondage for 400 years, but then they'll, they will be allowed to return back to the homeland. Acts 7 verse 30 is the verse I alluded to a moment ago that tells us it was 40 years with this new king come into existence. The king that had died, perhaps of Ramesses II. Many think that was the case. He ruled Egypt for a long time. But now it's safe for Moses to return. Twenty-four. And God heard the groaning of the people. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And He looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. It's not like God had forgotten them, but now it come into His mind, now it's time to do something. See, the time frame for God. And we would do well to learn this is not necessarily our schedule. No doubt there's people and the Egyptian slaves that were in bondage was wondering, where's God in all this? And many of them went to their graves without ever seeing the fulfillment of God's deliverance for them. And we have those similar situations. We have the promise that one day God's going to, Jesus is going to come again, right? And there's many people going to their graves and say, when is that going to happen? Has God forgotten us? No, He hasn't. God's schedule and our schedule is not one of the same. But now it's time. <coughs> 400 years they had been down there in slavery or in Egypt. But God cared about their situation. He had made a promise many years ago to Abraham He's going to fulfill that promise. And so he had Moses. 
to be a key player in this deliverance. And that takes us to chapter 3. Okay? Chapter 3. Familiar story to most of us. But maybe there's a few little details there that we can bring out that might help us. Verse number one, and, then, and Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Most of the time, father-in-law is called Jethro rather than Ruel. But Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock on the backside of the desert and came to a mountain of God, even the Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is also translated Mount Sinai. Sinai is a range of mountains. Remember when the ark landed on Mount Ararat? Ararat is a mountain range. It could be a lot of mountains within a mountain range. Sinai is sort of describing a mountain range. Horeb is a mountain up in that range and often is referred to as Mount Sinai. But that's where he was taking care of his sheep up in this mountain. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame out in the midst of a bush. The burning bush. And we'll get into that next week. We've got about three minutes. Final thoughts from you. Yes, sir. In some of my notations, I find it interesting. Jethro, great. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Was the title. Did it mean like ex excellency? And Raoul. Is his name. Jethro probably has reference to the priestly title. Or a professional name, if you will. And that's what the notation is like your excellency. And Jeth of uh, Raoul meant friend of God. So that he winds up in this situation yeah. in being taught by God the man. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that wow? You can see God's providence in all yeah. this. We can look back to how God worked all this stuff out. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they didn't see that. It was just routine for them. And our lives are the same way, Steve. We can look out and we can see later, look back in the past and see how God worked things out. Yes, ma'am. You know, what I say is when we pray and ask something for God, we almost want it immediately, at least within that week. And they like it. Do it always work that way. 40 years, 400 years. Wow. Here's a bunch of these people they were crying out for deliverance that died and never saw the fulfillment of that deliverance. We want it almost, I mean, the, uh, the Abraham's group would say we were being petty by thinking God should answer us in a day or two days or a week. I mean, that he waited for us in right. years. There, you know, they were in, in bondage 400 years there. Uh, to know what freedom meant had to have been handed down from from mouth, word of mouth. Yeah. You know, at 400 years, you got nobody alive there that, that ever was free. They never that, that you got a generation of people that never knew anything but bondage. All they ever knew was was slavery. And this caused them problems out here in the wilderness, because that's all they knew. Right. It's, it's all kind of like in this day and time, you hear of people that get. Uh, well, to put that in perspective, they want to go back because they don't know how to. It's like people today going back to our country in the 1600s. Yeah. Nobody lived today that lived in the 1600s or that lifestyle. Right. We never, we know nothing about that kind of life. So these people knew nothing about freedom prior to right. to to being slavery. Absolutely. All right, our time is gone. We'll pick up on chapter 3 next week. Thank you for your comments, and we'll move forward.